the historic arch bridge rehabilitation and widening. That's going to be given by John Sloan of AECOM. Um, John, John is AECOM's North Carolina Bridge Program Manager. I uh, want to thank, thank you all for hearing me out uh, and uh, having me present. Um, again, just agree with everyone. It's, it is quite an honor to be here. Um, I want to thank NCDOT as well for giving AECOM the opportunity to work on this project. Tim Sherrill's in the back uh, there. He's the one who um, gave us a shot at it. Uh, so I appreciate that very much. Um, in order to tell you about the, the bridge that we worked on, I, I need to talk to you about a previous bridge that we worked on in Knoxville, Tennessee uh, with Tennessee DOT. This is in downtown Knoxville. Um, <clears throat> Tennessee football stadium is right there. Uh, this is a landmark bridge that was built in the 1930s. We basically removed the superstructure on the bridge, uh, rehabilitated the arch ribs, uh, removed the piers uh, part of the way, and then uh, reconstructed the bridge. Um, so not only did we rehabilitate, but we also widened the superstructure um, to accommodate uh, additional capacity. So that brings us to uh, our bridge in North Carolina. This is located outside of Charlotte. Um, we have, uh, I'll go over just a little bit of terminology for arch bridge bridges. Um, this is the spring line here. This is an open spandrel arch bridge. So this, this is the spandrel bent here. This is the arch pier. Uh, the crown of the arch rib is up here at the top. Um, and then, uh, of course, the superstructure is, is uh, up top there as well. This structure is an important link in the central Piedmont of North Carolina. It, it uh, connects the towns of Troy and, I um, uh, apologize, I just went blank, blank on, the other, uh, on the other town. But uh, it's an important link in central North Carolina. There's a, a second bridge that was built there in the 1970s. Um, the arch bridge carries only one lane westbound and uh, the, the parallel bridge carries both lanes, two lanes in the eastbound direction. That shows the location there of, of the project, the star there uh, not far from North Carolina, or Charlotte, North Carolina. I wanna talk about the history of this bridge. Um, there's, there's a really fascinating story um, to tell all of y'all. Um, this bridge is the predecessor bridge to the one that we actually evaluated. It was constructed in 1920. Um, however, uh, as you can see, there's not much water there. It's just the river. You saw the dam or the, the water around the bridge in the previous slide. There's a dam that was going to be built downstream. So this photo shows that. Um, so the bridge was going to be submerged. It was less than five years old. Um, so what do, you, what do you do when you're about to submerge a bridge that's brand new? Um, well, they had to build the new bridge that's higher. Um, that's our bridge there under construction. So you see the steel truss under construction. Uh, there's, there's a photo of um, the predecessor bridge and the new bridge. Uh, if you go in, and do a Google search for America's Great Bridge Test, you can see a a film that's about uh, 16 minutes long that shows some load testing that was performed on this bridge. They decided uh, there was a, uh, a collection of experts got together from uh, AASHTO, uh, ACI, NCDOT, or I guess its predecessor organization, it wasn't called NCDOT at that time. Um, but they all got together and decided to run a, a battery of tests on this bridge to see what they could uh, how, how strong this bridge was, uh, how is it going to behave. <clears throat> so again, they devised an exhaustive program of tests. Those are tanks there that are filled with water up on the bridge. They had rollers under the tanks that uh, enabled them to move the tanks out onto the bridge uh, to uh, perform the load testing. Then they use these copper pins to uh, the deflection of some copper pins in order to measure the actual load 
uh, as they as they put additional water into into those tanks. Just for reference, um, there's the Ashto truck. The tanks weighed uh, 23 and a half tons when empty, 164 tons when full of water. So that's um, however many Ashto trucks. Uh, doing the math in your head there. Um, and they put multiple, uh, multiple tanks onto the bridge. Um, then they went to a second phase and they cut away the bridge deck so that they could study the free action of the arch. I think this guy has a harness. I can see it in the photo there. You can barely see it. Uh, they took some measurements, uh, measured the deflections and curvature of the arch rib, but the arch did not break, says the film. Um, you know, again, two tanks, uh, 328 tons total on, on the bridge. So then, uh, you know, you're done with your load testing. Um, what do you do with the bridge then? Well, <laughs> of course, we're going to hand it over to the military and let them uh, uh, drop some bombs on it. Um, there's a, an image of what later became known as the Battle of Swift Island Bridge. That's the name of the bridge. So this is, again, this is 1927. Um, so uh, interestingly enough, 1927 is the year that Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic, the first solo flight. He shelled it uh, with cannon fire. You see some images there. And then they put landmines on it. This guy here is uh, just detonated the landmine. That's his little device there, and the explosion is going off. <clears throat> and again, there's, there's the explosion. I'm not sure how long it took to get, the, th get through the permitting process for this. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if it was an EA or a EIS either. Um, but again, here's, here's our bridge. So um, it, it, again, it, it's a really wonderful story, fascinating story of how this bridge came to be. Um, NCDOT contacted us in the fall of 2015 to see if we could evaluate this bridge to try and preserve it. Um, they had heard about our work in, in Knoxville, and so we went in and talked with NCDOT about some of the challenges. But uh, again, very grateful that they gave us a shot at, at doing a feasibility study just to evaluate whether or not we could preserve this bridge. Um, and not only preserve it, but important aspect of this is widening. This is only uh, 20 feet wide between the rails. This used to be a two-lane bridge, one lane in each direction. Then it was a two-lane bridge. Once the uh, bridge, this bridge was built in the 70s, it was two lanes in the westbound direction. Uh, there were some issues with that, so finally around 2003, I think, it became a single lane in the westbound direction. The goal was to widen it to 36 feet between curbs. Here's some architectural details uh, with the spandrel bents. We have um, these little corbels and um, uh, the base is here as well. Um, the question is, how do you widen out? What do you do with the cap here? Um, we had to look into that as well and think about these uh, options. We had an architectural historian uh, on our team in our local office who was very helpful uh, as we went through the process. Uh, originally, this wasn't even going to be evaluated. Uh, the original idea was to basically two ideas. Uh, demolish the original bridge and put a conventional bridge in its place. Or the selected alternative was actually to build a third bridge to the south of the existing bridges and then use the arch bridge as a bike and ped facility. It was, the bridge was going to be taken over by the Land Trust for Central North Carolina. However, um, uh, there were some uh, political shenanigans, uh, went all the way to the state legislature. Somebody did not want this to happen, so uh, they made some legislation that made it prohibitive for the land trust to take ownership of the bridge. Um, so NCDOT was 
basically back to square one, and uh, that's when we got involved. So we did our feasibility study in 2016. Um, this was the team that we had together with NCDOT. Infrastructure engineers did the underwater inspection, uh, a little bit of geotech with Falcon Engineering, and then Siva, Siva's back there. He did some corrosion protection and material testing for us. Here's the scope of work. We did a load rating for the existing bridge, a load rating of a proposed bridge with a proposed superstructure. Uh, AECOM did the full above water evaluation and inspection. Um, and uh, again, some of the other items that I just mentioned. We also consulted with NEPA and Historic Preservation, and we completed a feasibility study document um, for the DOT. We, we discussed some of these things with uh, the State Historic Preservation Office. We met with them um, and had some uh, very productive discussions. This is what we had to work with when we got started. Um, not easy. Uh, this is pretty typical. It wasn't much better the rest of the plan set. Maybe uh, 30 or 40 drawings that we had to look through and read through, get out your magnifying glass and uh, evaluate. But, um, you know, you have to kind of piece things together, but uh, you study it enough and, and typically you can, you can figure out what's going on with the structure. Here's a typical section what we superimposed over the existing. Again, going from 20 feet all the way out to 36 feet. We looked at a spread box, which is what we had used for the Henley Street Bridge in Knoxville. <clears throat> as far as the analysis, um, we had a much stiffer superstructure and also a much heavier superstructure. And we were able to utilize that to our benefit um, so that the superstructure is actually relieving some of the load off of the arch ribs. Um, there were expansion joints at third points of, in the superstructure at third points of the arch span. So we were able to eliminate those. And uh, I'll show you a slide in just a second that, that shows the benefit of that. Um, you do get a lot of negative moment at the spring line of the arch rib. Um, but um, you know, the additional dead load can be beneficial because these are lightly reinforced concrete members. And so if you can get that dead load concentric through the arch rib, um, that actually improves your capacity and your performance. So this is where we were originally with the original load rating is the orange dot. This is basically where we were. This is the arch rib interaction diagram. We add load and we add stiffness to the superstructure. We're actually a little bit farther away from uh, the curve, which is a benefit. So um, that's, again, that's a negative moment at the spring line of the arch rib. Positive moment, um, we eliminated the uh, joints at the third points in the arch rib. This was the original and this is our improved condition. So we were able to improve things a lot with in positive bending in the arch rib. That brings us to the inspection. Um, these are the caps at the piers in the vicinity uh, of the expansion joints. A um, lot of corrosion, a lot of issues there. Uh, here's a view of the outside. Um, I, I wanna talk for just a second about the progression of the deterioration. Um, here's crack, a crack parallel to a corner. Um, we see a lot of this condition. As time goes by, you get a delamination, which is what you see here. Again, this is in the arch piers. A little more time goes by, you get a spall. Um, so I just want to encourage you, if, um, my opinion is if you, if you see this condition and you need to think, you're thinking about repairs, um, crack injection is not going to help you here, uh, something more robust. Um, chipping it out and removing the corrosion is probably the best solution if you're, if you're going to do anything for it. Um, so um, we saw a lot of this throughout the piers. Um, and basically what we decided as we evaluated the piers was, you know what, let's just demolish them all the way down to the spring line as far as we can go. 
um, because they are in relatively poor condition. They're not real tall. It's not a huge, ex huge expense. So let's go ahead and um, demolish those all the way down. Here's uh, an image uh, that infrastructure engineers provided for us of the underwater. Um, again, the acoustic imaging, you see a little bit of uh, footing exposure here, a uh, little bit of debris, but all in all, um, these piers underwater were in very good condition. So that was definitely a very important aspect of the study. There was some scaling around the water line, so we're going to have to address that. We'll put a concrete jacket around things to help prevent further uh, scaling and, and uh, loosening of the aggregate. That brings us to the arch ribs, and um, I think I see some nodding heads there. Uh, this is a beautiful site for bridge inspectors. You see actually the grain of the formwork. So again, this is on the outside, the exterior of the arch ribs for 90 year old concrete. That's really amazing, um, the, the condition of the concrete that it's in there. At those joints, there, was, there were some issues, cracks and, and such. And again, we're gonna recommend to go ahead and chip that away and um, clean out clean everything out, clean the reinforcing out, and um, patch it up. There was scaling at the top of the arch ribs. I think this has been there really since the beginning because I think it was difficult for them to consolidate the concrete at the top. They had to actually form it. You can see the form boards there. Um, I, I thought about this a lot, what we should do. I think we're just going to leave it. It's not real deep, quarter of an inch deep and such, half inch maybe at the most. So we're probably just going to leave it. And that brings us to the corrosion protection service life analysis. Uh, took uh, multiple cores to evaluate the chloride profile, evaluate the strength. Uh, we evaluated for carbonization. <clears throat> There's the phenolphthalein there. So as far as cores, we, we had good strength in the concrete. Um, the cover survey was uh, reasonably good in terms of uh, the depth of cover. Um, we also had some petrographic cores that showed that the concrete was in very good condition, uh, correlated with what we saw out um, uh, with the visual inspection. Um, as we patch, we are gonna use discrete anodes in our patches. Uh, and we're going to coat everything with a breathable sealer, and that's going to help. Um, since we've got so many different types of concrete uh, going back, we've got repair material, we've got existing material, we've got new concrete material. We're just going to coat it over um, with, a, with a breathable coating uh, to make sure that all of that, all those differences are hidden underneath of the coating. Here's a visualization of the bridge. Um, we did a few of these to help uh, the Historic Preservation Office visualize what we were planning on doing. Um, so that was very helpful for them. And for conclusions, uh, we were able to um, get this through concurrence point uh, and all the various NEPA concurrence points, and it was selected as the least environmentally damaging practicable alternative. Um, it was no adverse effects upon the historic structure with conditions, and those conditions were that we had to essentially maintain the, the historic character of the bridge. Um, a, de minima, a de minimis impact uh, in accordance with the Department of Transportation Act of 1966. Uh, we're going for a 75-year service life, and uh, we anticipated saving uh, a little over $4 million compared with the uh, additional bridge that was originally considered. So um, I, I like to say that uh, beauty and economy are not mutually exclusive, so especially in this case. Um, a few more conclusions. Um, we, Wanted to eliminate as many joints as possible. We are using joints at the piers, um, but we're eliminating as many as, as reasonably possible. 
we did document all the defects that we found just to help us as we were going back and making decisions about what to repair and what not to repair. And that goes back to, I appreciated uh, the contractor's presentation at the end of the morning session, trying to be as clear as we possibly can on the defects, what we're repairing, and um, exactly uh, how much repair material we're gonna have, try to eliminate as much ambiguity and, and risk as we possibly can in the, con uh, in the contract. As far as uh, final design, we are currently wrapping up our final design. Um, we're hoping to turn our plans in in another uh, month or two. And we did utilize a three-dimensional model. We use, utilize a 2D model for the feasibility study. We're doing a 3D model, uh, or we, we finished up a 3D model for the final design. Um, and we did use a laser, a laser survey to basically get, pin down the geometry of the arch ribs and the pedestals. Um, so that was, that was very helpful. And um, we are very grateful. We did receive uh, an ACEC award for the project um, last fall. So again, just wanna um, Thank NCDOT for the opportunity to work on this project. We're excited about it, uh, finishing up final design. Uh, let date is March of 2019, so um, looking forward to that. Uh, the preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.